there's no such thing as a Romeo and Juliet scenario with two teens that run away. That's okay. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. I'm talking about two teens. They're missing. They think they're in love. But why are they running? What is compelling them to leave their families, their school, their everything, eluding law enforcement, actually escaping and staying on the run? What is it that they fear? And what is going to happen to these two teens, one as young as just 15 years old? With me right now is a special guest, and we've heard a lot about him, but now let's hear from him. Joining me right now is Penny Lyle, 15-year-old Penny Lyle's father, Ryan Lyles. Mr. Lyles, this whole thing has spiraled, has spun out, way out of control. I know from talking to you, before we went to air, that your number one concern is getting Penny home safely. How did this whole thing start? Well, it started with my my older daughter's cell phone. She said it needed to get fixed. And I said, we'll set it on the counter. And the cell phone sat there for a day or two and started going off with messages. I looked at the phone and seen some incriminating messages on the cell phone. What did you see? Just they're buying drugs, they're using drugs, they're sneaking out at night, they're not being responsible kids. And it wasn't just my oldest daughter, it was all of them. Jonathan's the only one with a car. Now, hold on. I want to clarify. They're not out buying crack and heroin. You're talking about marijuana and possibly Molly. What, what's called Molly is, is what they had mentioned. Marijuana and Molly. Which is? And I, I, it's, it's, it's supposed to be MDMA or ecstasy. Yeah. And my concern with that is it could have that fentanyl. You it know, could have anything that, in it. You don't know what it's been mixed Yeah, with. it could have anything. I, I don't... So the no older sister, that. Penny, who is 15, older sister, leaves her cell phone. It's ding, ding, dinging. You look at it, and as I would, you start reading it. Of course you're going to read it. And you find on Penny's older sister's cell phone texts and messages about marijuana, about Molly... Um, and, of course, there are parents out there that only wish their children were just on marijuana and or Molly and not heroin and not cocaine and not methamphetamines. But still, I would be beside myself as well if I found out the twins were using marijuana and Molly. So, yeah, find other things on there about sex, which no dad wants to think about his daughter, but it happens. But... It's my understanding from what you told me earlier, your big concern was about the drugs. And so what do you do? Well, there's, there's just so much stuff. Like, we had to talk about this. <laughs> um, so I text Penny, come straight home after school. Because, you know, sometimes they'll meander around and drive the logging roads. Or this is what I thought they were doing, you know, just going to lunch. I'm, I'm really now, I'm not sure exactly what they would do. But. So you texted Penny, who is now missing, and the, I mean, did you text her I only siblings? Text, I only, only text Penny, come straight home after school. Um, my son would ride the bus home, so I didn't have to worry about him, and my oldest daughter had graduated already. So it was just Penny I needed to tell, come straight home. But in the meantime, I had told my wife what I had found, and my oldest daughter had heard that conversation because she was here at the house. And she called Penny and told Penny, Dad got my cell phone, and he knows everything. He, he knows it all. He's in the cell phone. He's got access to it. We're busted. 
in based on your old your your other daughter calling Penny and going at the gig is up. Dad knows everything. He read my phone. Penny yeah. is afraid because she's going to get in trouble. Penny is afraid that she knows what's going to come. She knows that Jonathan is. She's not responsible to have Jonathan around the house anymore. She knows that that's. Because we had an agreement, you know what I mean? Jonathan could stay here if you guys got straight A's. There's not any, like, physical intimacy. There's not... There was rules set out to this relationship. And we shouldn't have done it to begin with, but there was rules set out. Now, and, you and let Jonathan... When you rules. guys moved, you let Jonathan, who has now turned 18, move with your family. Why? Well, so... I was very strict with my oldest daughter. We didn't allow dating. We didn't allow that type of thing. And it, and it didn't turn out well. And so I thought, well, we're going to try this a different way. We're going to let Penny have a, have a boyfriend and we're going to, we're going to like, you know, nurture the relationship and, and, and watch it and be involved in it and teach her the proper, you know what I mean? The proper way to, to have a relationship. I figured I would go that route because the other way of, of just nothing didn't work. Okay. And made, you know, made my other daughter lash out a little bit and be rebellious. So Jonathan didn't live in the house with us. I, I have a large property here in Oregon and I have an apartment and he lived in the, the apartment. Right. And like they, they could, there was curfews to where he had to go to his apartment. And so it wasn't a free for all here. So, question, after your daughter Penny, who is now missing, gets tipped off, dad's mad, he knows the whole thing, what happens then? Well, I I just continued to look at these texts, and I really, I didn't think anything about Penny not coming home or anything like that, because she's a good kid. At about 3.45, 4 o'clock, I'm texting Penny, you know, where you at? And I didn't get anything in return. And I called her several times and nothing. So I drove to the school. And when I got to the school, the doors were locked and the sheriff was there and they had Penny inside. The doors were locked. Said, the sheriffs were there. The doors were locked. The sheriff, they, they wouldn't let me in the school to talk with my daughter. I imagine because Penny said she was scared. Scared so of what? I sat there for a, a, Wait, what, what did they say well, she, she was scared of? Well, she, she wouldn't say. She would just say she's scared of losing Jonathan. Okay. Because so, she, what, in your mind, assumed that because she's in trouble that you were going to make him leave? That was already a known consequence. They're only allowed to have this if they were going to be responsible people. And if you can't be responsible, then, like, if, if your grades fall, if... if you know what I mean? There's, there's response. You, you have to be responsible in order to have that privilege. And they were doing all right. Their grades had started falling a little bit. And, you know, Jonathan didn't do any sports this year. And Penny didn't do any sports. They didn't do any of that stuff that their parents claimed they did. They didn't do any of it. They weren't involved at school at all. They wouldn't go to church with me. And it was, it was, it was starting to get a little frustrating, to, to say the least. But now I realize why. When you get to the school, the doors are locked, the sheriff's there, and Penny's inside. What happened then? I waited around for a few minutes, and I thought, you know, this is, is fruitless. I need to call my wife, tell my wife what's going on, and get her involved. I called my wife, and she left work immediately, and she went to the school. I went home at that point. You know, I had a, a other son that's there, and, you know, I needed to go home. Well, plus they told you they're afraid of you. So you leave, yeah. and your wife gets home because your goal is to get Penny. Yes, my goal is just to get Penny at this point. And then what and happens? My wife is there, and they won't let her in. And they're questioning Penny and, and Jonathan for, for two, two hours, two and a half hours. And there was no pictures of abuse or videos of abuse or allegations of abuse at that time. They simply were scared to go home because they knew the consequence of their actions. Now, as you know, it has been alleged there is a video of you abusing 
one of your children. What is your response to that? I want to uh, let's let's see it and put it on national news for everybody to see. That's my response to that. I, I'd like to pr- have them produce it, whoever says they have it, and let's see it because it doesn't exist because I don't abuse my children. Question: Were you yes. in the court hearing when Jonathan's dad gets a protective order against you? Were you there? No, they did that in Missouri, and I'm in Oregon. Okay. To your knowledge, was a video or anything like a video or text messages produced to the judge? There was, from the paperwork I got, the, I forget what it's called, the the evidence or whatever that they put was three statements written on handwritten paper, and they all said the same thing. Ryan called me on this date and threatened to kill me and my family. That was the three things that were listed in the report. I don't know if there's anything else, but that's what I was given, and that's what the order was based on. Ryan Lyles, this is Penny Lyles' dad. Are you telling me that you have not abused your children? Never, not once. I treat them like princesses and princes. My, My family means everything to me. Okay, so... Can we talk about something else you told me? Yes, ma'am. How you tried to give them, you gave them a horse. You got a car for Jonathan when he moved with you, a a truck, I believe it was. Tell me about how you raised your children, specifically Penny. So Penny is actually my first first daughter. my oldest daughter, she, she's my girl, but she's not biologically mine. I've had her since she was one, but Penny is my first girl. She's my, she's my baby, and I've treated her as such her whole life. You know, this, this prom, this, this winter formal, you know, I, 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 I pinned Jonathan's flower, you know, on his, on his suit that I bought him. You know, they took my truck. They, you know, like, I, I treated Jonathan, too, like he was my own. When his car broke down, you know, the next day or the day after, I, I got him a truck to drive. I bought him, you know, and handed him the keys and the title and said, here you go. Uh, I, I, I just don't understand what the, I, I, I just, this, this whole thing is just baffling. Because right now, it's my understanding, and, and we're going to talk to Penny. It's my understanding, Mr. Lyle, that Penny and Jonathan and I can honestly tell you, I don't know what state they're in right now. What will, what's their true location? They're afraid that if they come back, they are afraid you are going to insist that Jonathan go to jail and be prosecuted, and they're going to be split up. That is their big fear. What is so your response? I, I didn't, I, when, when, this whole thing started. There's several texts that I sent them, and I talked to Penny and told them, if you guys continue this, it's going to be out of Dad's hands. It's going to get out of Dad's hands where there's nothing I can do about this, and Jonathan's going to get in trouble. Just come home. Just come home. Even through all the all the stuff, the first week, I agreed with the police. Yeah, let's not press. Let's not press charges. Let's just get him home. We don't want Jonathan to be scared. Um, I, I, the, the officer asked me, Hey, this is our plan. Is this okay with you? I said, yes, a hundred percent. Do whatever you think it takes to get, to get them home. Um, now after the second time that, that he did what he did, I don't, I don't, it's out of my hands. You mean when she slipped away from authorities and he picked her up and they took off? Yes. Got it. If authorities come to you and say, do you want to press charges against Jonathan? If you think you can get Penny to come home, if you ask for no charges, would you do it? A hundred percent. But this, this is my fear. Jonathan has already proved that, that, that he will follow Penny and, and take her. And if I let her back here, of course, there's going to be, you know, like she, 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 she's not going to be rewarded for this kind of behavior. I mean, that's understandable for any parent, right? She's not gonna like take her to Disneyland for doing this. So what? What? I, I don't know what. I don't have. I don't know what to do about this situation. 
I don't know, don't the, know answer. the answer. But you would ask authorities not to prosecute as it stands right now. I want to ask you about this TRO, this TPO protective order. I'm reading it. Got the same thing you've got. And there's a handwriting in it, and it says, it, this is an allegation by Jonathan's dad, Wayne Stockle. Okay. November 14, Ryan Lyle stated, I'm reading what he wrote, uh, Mr. Lyle. I, I have it in front of me. Okay. Ryan Lyle stated, I will kill your entire family, in quotes, over the phone. I asked him to stop making threats. November 15, next day, same threats repeated, asked him to stop. November 16, same threats repeated on phone, asked him to stop. In the next little segment, it says, repeated threats have made have been made against me and my family. He sent a text stating he is coming to our town. The text stated he has my children's information. The threats were, I will kill your entire family. What is your response to those claims? So the, the only truth in that is that I text him, that I said I was coming to his town, and I know all your families where they live. But that's not the entirety of the text. The, the, that text... With me saying, I will find my daughter. I think you're helping them. And if you have my daughter, I will find them. I will never quit looking. I, I believe that they, they have Penny right now is what I believe. I believe Penny's there. You think in, Penny in the is with, with Jonathan's family? A hundred percent. I think I think that they're, they're involved in this more than they're letting on, and they're helping them. And the fact that they say that the kids were sweeping uh, leaves and doing odd jobs is just nonsense. Okay, I, I have your text, uh, and this is what it says. We know you're helping them. Okay, you do believe they're helping them. The last thing you yes. need is us in Thayer, which is where they live. Uh, yes. I will be there soon watching your family looking for my kid. I have all your older kids' info as well. I will find Penny. You're a pile of but Jonathan is going to get in prison for being a pedophile. You keep helping and giving them info. You be getting in prison too. And I, okay. I'm not proud Why of that. Why did you text that? I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of what I said. But that in context, he had just called me and told me that if I touch a hair on Jonathan's head, he would kill me and so this isn't just a one-sided thing of me threatening. This is two dads that are very, very angry and very emotional reacting towards each other. With only me going to, or with only him going to the police. What has your life been like? What has your life been like since Penny took off? So I don't, so until, until we found them in Tonopah, until they had them in Tonopah and we knew they were out of state, I literally drove around all day and all night looking for him. Just all day, all night, all day, all night, all day, all night, every single day. So what about your wife? What about your wife? She misses Penny. She, she's just distraught. She's having to, uh, when they found him in Tonopah, she immediately started driving towards Bakersfield. And she was over halfway there when they told her that Penny was gone. So she had been, you know, not sleeping for a week and then had to drive for 16 hours to Bakersfield. And she, she had been a rough go at it. You told me you spent days and nights just driving around. We thought they were hiding in the woods. And so we've been, I just drove all the, all the woods from here to hours, just hours, just every woods, every road there was. How do you sleep without your daughter? There's none. There's zero sleep. If you could speak to Penny right now and she could hear your voice, what would you say? Penny, Penny knows the truth and she knows her dad and her mom and her brother loves her. And she can just come home and we have to get on with, with life. This, this just can't go on like this. It's, 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 we can't maintain it like this, Penny. We just We love you. Come home. Your room is just as you left it. Just, just come home. Mr. Lyles, by the time I get a hold of a case, it's a felony. Uh, a young girl has been murdered. She's been raped. Uh, 
kidnap, sex traffic. They're out there. I mean, I hope that they're with Jonathan's family being taken care of because if they're not, they're out there on their own trying to get money, trying to make it, trying to find something to eat, trying to find a place to stay. Do you agree with me, Mr. Lyles, that until you and Mr. Stockle come to some kind of a truce, they're not coming home? No, I, I don't think that Mr. Stockle should have anything to do with it. Um, but I do think that I am happy if they, if they are with, at, at Mr. Stockle's house because they are out in the world, and we know what a scary place that is. I do have to say I, I would prefer if they were there. I can't imagine not knowing where my daughter or my son are. I, I, I don't think I could live. With me, you are hearing Ryan Lyles explaining much of what has been said and his plea to Penny. And one more opportunity, your message to Penny is what? Just come home, sweetheart. Wherever you're at, just we'll come get you. We'll get on an airplane, come get you, come home, and we'll continue on with life. There are going to be some hard decisions that have to be made, but we, we love you and we're here for you to, to help you make them. And and just come home. you you, you got to come home, sweetheart. Mr. Lyles, thank you for joining us. With me now is teen girl Penny Lyles, who has now been missing with her sweetheart, Jonathan. Penny, your father has told us he will do whatever it takes to get you back home, worried sick, driving around looking for you, that if it were up to him alone, he would not press charges against Jonathan. He also denies any and all abuse on you or anybody in your family. What's your response? Yeah, I'm doing everything in my power to not go back to that god-awful home. They are lying. They've lied their whole lives about everything, and nobody should believe a word. Would you go back home? Would you go back home? No, I, I'm doing everything to not go back home. Why? Because if I go back home, he is going to do horrible things to me, and I'm just going to live this miserable life, and he is going to try to do something to Jonathan, and he's just not going to tell me. He's just using that, so I'll come home. When you say he, your dad, will do horrible things to you, what do you mean? It could be dragging me through the gravel by my hair. It could just be threatening to kill me. It could just, it could just be slapping me in the face numerous times to the point my mouth is just absolutely gushing blood. It, it could be so many different things. Have you been abused in the home? Yes. What happened? Well, for starters. <laughs> One of his games he would have us play is where we would run through the backyard and he would shoot us with the BB gun. And he he also did horrible things to my little brother. Like one time he picked my little brother up by his hood and was choking him because my little brother left an orange juice can in the sink. Um, he dragged me and my sister and my other brother through the gravel by our hair and said he was going to send us away because he... We were little, and he, like, we, my sister sprayed hairspray on the mirror, but she was too scared to admit that it was her. So he started screaming at us and going crazy. And since no one would admit what, like, who did it, he threatened to take us to juvie. And that's when he started dragging us to the car by our hair, saying he was going to go get the hairspray can fingerprinted and send us to juvie over it. Wait, who sprayed what? Who sprayed who with hairspray? Um, my older sister sprayed, like, the mirror in the bathroom with hairspray. Just, she was a little kid. She was just doing little kid things. <laughs> and you remember being dragged by your hair through gravel? Yes. How old were you at that time? I would say I was um, nine or ten. Since that time, what abuse have you endured? Um... He doesn't do too much to me anymore, but now, lately, he's just been screaming at me. He's just threatening me. He 
he he makes me do weird things like sit on his lap and he tells me about how much virgins are worth and how much he could sell me for. Okay, whoa, 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 what? <laughs> he would he would make me sit on his lap sometimes and if I didn't and told him I was uncomfortable, he would just tell me that I didn't love him and then he proceeded to tell me about how much virgins are worth and that he could sell me for a lot of money. When did this occur? Um, I would say maybe a year ago. It was like right before I moved to Missouri. Where is your mom in all this? Um, just standing there by my dad, not really saying anything. So between the incident when you were 9 or 10, when you were dragged by your hair through gravel, and the incident where you are sitting in his lap, and he is discussing how much virgins are worth. Was there any abuse, and that was about a year ago, is there any abuse in between those five years? Um, yeah, they would just repeatedly smack me and just things like, I understand consequences for action, but like being smacked is one thing, but being like repeatedly hit is another. You mean hit in your face? Yes. Hit where else? On your body? Uh, my legs, my butt, my back, my for arms. What? For what? You're hit for what? What reason? Just just anything. Like, it's it could be really simple things. It could be just I didn't under Like, if I would, if he told me to do something and I asked questions, like, that he thought were dumb about, like, the instructions, he would just get mad and just lash out. How often did this happen, Penny? Probably every day. Was it with an open hand or a fist or an object? Um, all of the above. What object? A belt, a book, a plate, a cup. Tell me what happened the day that you and Jonathan took off. Well... My dad um, called me, and he told me that he found, like, I was using drugs on my sister's phone, which is not true. I do not use drugs. And my older sister, my older sister, she has done some things that she has before she has gotten into some drug use, and it was on her phone that she was doing that. But then he tried to say that it was me and Jonathan were doing all this, and which it's just not true. So... Then he told me that he was just going to make my life miserable and he was going to beat Jonathan up. And then Now, wait a minute. Home. Is this in text or verbal? No. It was over the phone. So he called at you at school? Yeah. Okay. And? And so after um, that, I told Jonathan what was going to happen, and we were scared. So I decided to try to come forth again with um, what he's done to me because I – went to DHS in Missouri, and they didn't do anything. When did so that happen? You went to the Department of Family, Children, and Health Services? Uh, yeah, I went through it by going to my school counselor there, and I told them, and they got me a DHS officer or whatever, and I had to have an interview with them, and they interviewed me, my older sister, and my little brother. And when my parents found out because DHS went to the house, they came and pulled me and my siblings out of school, and we had to sit at the house for the rest of the day because my parents didn't want us talking to them. And then what happened with that investigation? I have no idea. The DHS, when they went to my house, my parents just told them to leave, and they left, and I never heard And how old were you again. at that time, Penny? Fifteen. Fifteen, one five, is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. That was in Missouri. Nothing mm -hmm. became of it. What was your dad and mom's reaction to you getting in touch with DHS? Well, the school counselor. Um, they didn't know it was me. I tried to do it all anonymous because I knew that if it didn't do anything and my parents knew that I had done that, that things would just be awful for me at my home. And what did you tell DHS? What did you tell the school counselor? Well... Um, I started off with that my dad is a felon and has all these guns in the house because that's 
it's right off the bat, just illegal. And um, Wait, illegal to have guns in the house? Well, he has um, a whole safe of guns, and they're technically all in my mom's name, but he's used them before and all this. So I know that is illegal. I've... Uh, question. So you go to the school counselor and you tell them about the guns. What else did you tell them at that time? I told them just a brief um, about the abuse because um, I had to go do all my classes and stuff, and I didn't want to waste all my time because of school and everything like that and I knew my parents would do all that and they had to go talk to my little brother and we were just on like a time frame for being at school for it to remain anonymous so I just gave them like a brief rundown of pretty much everything that's happened at my home to me and my little brother and my sister. Have you ever been sex abused? Uh, no, just weirdly sexual things, not like rape or anything like that. When you say weirdly sexual things, what happened? Um, well, he would manage, like, my body weight, and he, when my boyfriend came to my house, he asked my boyfriend why he got with me, because I don't have a good body. Okay. And I just, just sitting on his lap and telling me about how much virgins are worse, those were just, and he, it's just always just things about my weight, and he would just shame me for it. And just things like that. You're very thin. I mean, aren't you 5'5", five, five, 120 pounds? I'm 5'6", probably like 110 now. How are, I'm going to circle back to the day you decided to leave, but how are you living and eating and surviving? Well, even though I'm a kid, I'm, I, I, I've had to live as an adult. I have, I'm very mature. I have a mindset. I'm not dumb, that's for sure. And I've just been getting along by the money that we already had. And we've been doing jobs for people like raking leaves. And um, we unloaded a U-Haul, which we made $160 from that. What are you, are you thinking you're ever going to go back to school? Are you going to go to college? What's going to happen to your I have, life? I have plans to go back to school. If it all comes down to it, I'll get my GED. But I do want to eventually go to college for business. The day that you decided to go on the run with Jonathan, I know you're, you're saying your dad called you at school and confronted yeah. you about possible drug use, which you deny. You mm -hmm. say he told you he was going to make your life miserable. So what did you yeah. decide to do? Um, I decided to put an end to everything that's happened to me. I've had enough. I, that was my last string, and I want to live a normal life as a normal teenager, and I never got that. So that is what I'm pushing towards. So I, I told the counselor. The counselor told me, let's go to the office. We'll get the cops down here and everything and the cops told me when I was there I'd showed them pictures and things of abuse that he did to my sister because he would like go through my phone all the time so it was really really hard for me to get evidence and he told me that if I had stuff on my phone like that that he would just make everything miserable and awful and I, I don't really know what that means like exactly so I wasn't what is the out. abuse on your sister that you had on your phone um my sister was um, standing up for herself because my parents were just shaming her and down talking her because telling her that she's just never going to be anything in her life and that she's just worthless. So my sister was standing up for herself and my dad and she wanted to go downstairs to calm down. And my sister's a very religious person. And so she finds herself like calm down when she reads the Bible. So she was going to go downstairs just to calm down to her room to read the Bible. And my parents proceeded to go downstairs um, attack my sister my sister was obviously not just gonna let that happen so she tried to fight back a little bit but then my dad grabbed her dragged her up the stairs and um put his hand over her mouth and she was screaming and like she was saying that she couldn't breathe very well and my dad just wasn't listening and continued to drag her upstairs and threw her on the um living room floor and it just they started screaming and yelling and 
lots of hitting was going on with that. And you have a video of that? Um, I only have, I had my friend over at the time and we were just, my dad wouldn't let me like let us come out of the room. So we were just sitting in my room. So we took like videos in my room so you can hear what's going on and you can hear my sister screaming and banging around. And then we have pictures of like what she looked like after. What did she look like? Um, her face was all beat up and puffy and she had my dad's hand marks all over her. Uh, she, her face was like, it was bruised on her cheek a little bit. Um, you could see nail marks on her arms. So that day when you decide to leave, why did you leave? Um, the cops, when I was there, they told me that for that night I could find a safe spot to stay, like at a friend's house. But then they proceeded that night to hunt me down like I was a criminal, and they told me that they were going to detain me and that I should just go home, get abused, and then come back. Why would they want you to go home and get abused and come back? Because they told me that I just didn't have enough evidence and that they couldn't do anything. So what did you do? Um, I was going to go stay at my friend's house for the night, but then the cops were trying to come to her house, so then that night, I was just hiding everywhere, laying down in bushes. At one point, the cops and my dad were right next to me, and I had to get up and run, and I managed to get away where they didn't see me. And then me and John, my dad had told Jonathan that he was going to shoot him and kill him and send him to jail and was just saying awful things. So out of fear for both of us, we both decided to leave and just drive away. Now... I understood that one of the school counselors told you to slip out the back, and you did. Yeah, but, yeah, that is 100% true, but the cops, the cops told, like, the school and everything, like, they said it was all okay. And when um, my mom was at the school, um, Jonathan went outside to talk to my mom, and my mom had said that my dad hadn't done anything to me since I was nine, which, right in front of the cops, so that alone should be enough. You mean the incident where you were dragged on gravel? Yeah. So did you slip out the door pursuant to what the school counselor said? Um, I, I slipped out the back door and I got picked up by my friend. And I didn't think that I would be doing everything that I am now, of course. But I was planning on just at least I just need a new home. That's all, that's all I was trying to do is find somewhere that I can go. When you say a friend picked you up, was it Jonathan? No, Jonathan did not come with me. When did you and Jonathan reunite? Um, when Jonathan told me that he was scared and that my dad was chasing him through the woods and Jonathan had lost his shoes and was running barefoot in the woods and it was cold and everything like that. So uh, we came and me and my friend went and got him. And then he, cause he was cold, freezing, terrified that he was going to get shot or something by my dad. How did that whole thing happen? How did it end up that Jonathan, from what I understand, Jonathan says he was running through the woods, afraid he was going to be shot. How did that whole thing well, happen? I wasn't there, but I'll let Jonathan tell you. Okay. Jonathan, how did that happen? Okay, so whenever I was making my way down to my vehicle to leave the school and to just go to a different town away from Penny, away from Penny's dad and everything, I was walking down to my car with a group of people, and Penny's mom was sitting down there, which I was totally fine with Penny's mom and everything. She's usually not too, too bad, but she usually holds a handgun on her. That's why I had a group of people with me just to Wait, who her. holds? Oh, she has a handgun on her. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, she, yep. And then as I was proceeding down to my vehicle, then Brian pulled up and they were surrounding my vehicle and everything. And then when I was down there, Brian spotted me right, right up the hill from where they, they were at. And he yelled that he was going to shoot me. I sprinted straight to the police officers, which were behind the school because I just had talked to them and they were behind the school. So I went and informed them that Ryan said this. And then they went down to Ryan and asked him if he said that. And Ryan simply just said no. And then they were like, well, Ryan said no. 
and they searched Ryan, and he didn't have any handgun on him, but they did not search Jessica or anything. And Ryan usually has a pocket knife on him and everything. And while while the police were down there, then I went back towards that way with my group of friends and everything. And Ryan spotted me, and he chased down somebody else. But as he was chasing my friend down, as he thought it was me, then he said, you better run. I'm going to get you. And I ran through the forest and I was running through creeks and everything, cold water, mud, you name it, every, everything. And then I heard a bunch of dogs barking. And that's whenever I texted my mom that I was scared because I thought that they had canines after me. <laughs> and I was hiding out in a bush for a long time. Uh, Penny was two towns over. And I was texting her. I was like, I'm freezing cold. I don't know who to text. Can you guys please come pick me up and at least bring me somewhere so that I'm warm? And they come, and came and picked me up. And whenever Penny and I were together, then I tried to de-escalate Ryan a little bit by texting him. And So you're, was he, in fact, chasing you? Or do you, did you think that because you heard dogs barking? Okay, so he... He was going to proceed to chase me, but he chased down one of my friends that were, like, around the same height, ha same okay. hairstyle and everything. And he also texted us how Ryan chased him down. So he chased down the wrong person. So, yes, he would have chased me through the woods if he chased down the correct person. Okay. So you thought he was chasing you at the time, but he had really chased your friend. Yes. Okay. Got it. And then hearing the dogs only exacerbated that thought in your mind that you were being chased by him and you feared he had a gun. Okay, I understand yeah. that. So what happened, Penny actually is apprehended by authorities and then somehow she doesn't want to go home, she doesn't want you to be prosecuted, and she slips away by saying she's going to the bathroom. What happened? You're talking about in Nevada? Yeah. Okay, so whenever Penny and I got there, then uh, she was planning on going to one of her uncles, which she barely knew. And from what like I picked up uh, about him living at Penny's household, that he wasn't like the best, best person. So then I told Penny that it wasn't safe and everything, that it's just not like a good idea. And Penny told me that like she was uncomfortable way before I even said anything about that to her. And Penny and I both went into the building, and I told the guy that uh, Penny was going to the bathroom, and then him and I went to his office, and then he went to the bathroom, and that's whenever I went, like, towards the back door, but Penny was at the back door, and then she was like, we need to leave. I, I don't feel safe. I feel like I'm going to go home. And then she opened up the door, ran to my vehicle, and she said, get me out of here right now. And that's whenever we left Nevada, we got out of Nevada and went to Arizona and got out of Nevada. Question. I'm, yes. I'm not going to ask you where you are. I told Penny's father, I don't know where you are, but I do. Can Penny hear me right now? Yes. Okay. I do want you to hear what her dad said. Her dad is not on with us right now, but he spoke to me earlier. Could you please play cut three? Just come home, sweetheart. Wherever you're at, just we'll come get you. We'll get on an airplane, come get you, and come home, and we'll continue on with life. There's going to be some hard decisions that have to be made, but we, we love you, and we're here for you to, to help you make them, and, and just come home. you you, you got to come home, sweetheart. I believe that Penny is concerned, Jonathan, that you're going to be prosecuted. Uh, you turned 18, and she's 15. I'm not entirely sure that you could be protected under the Romeo-Juliet law because you guys' ages are very close together. I'm going to go to Lisa Herrick on that. But I want you to hear, Penny, what your dad says in cut one. If you think you can get Penny to come home, if you ask for no charges, would you do it? A hundred percent. 
Uh, Penny, sit tight. Jonathan, hold on. I want you to hear from Lisa Herrick, a juvenile lawyer. Lisa, uh, would Romeo and Juliet statutes protect Jonathan from being prosecuted? My understanding is yes, Nancy. Every Romeo and Juliet defense that I've ever seen is usually within three years. Unless I'm getting their birthdays wrong, it sounds like she was already 15 before he turned 18. So they would be within three years of each other and the Romeo and Juliet laws should apply. There will be no, mm, well, I'm not sure what there will be, but there could be claims of statutory rape. There could be claims Mm -hmm. of kidnapping. There could be claims of taking a juvenile across state lines. Those are the charges that I see now from my viewpoint. To prosecute a rape charge, Penny would have to testify that sex occurred. As far as a kidnapping or a transporting child across state lines, that could be proven with or without Penny's testimony. That said, a Romeo and Juliet statute might still protect him. Penny, if you thought Jonathan was not going to be prosecuted, would you go back home? I'm never going back to my home ever not once. And once I'm 18, I do not plan to speak to my parents ever again. With me also is Wayne Stockel. This is Jonathan's dad. Mr. Stockel, thank you for being with us. Um, You're welcome. Thank you for all your help. (laughs) Mr. Stockel, I had a long talk with Penny's dad, who says that he did send those texts and that he wished he had never done it. I'm sure he does wish he had never done it. I feel that a big problem to resolving this is everything that's happened between you and Penny's dad. Would you be willing to work together to... I don't know that she's ever going to go back to her parents' home. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Would you still be willing to work with him at this juncture? Because they can't stay on the run forever. At some point, Penny is going to be found. I hope this all ends today. I I hope that some legal experts help these two kids. They were scared for their lives. They're still, I don't see how you can be prosecuted when somebody's going to kill you and you run. It just seems crazy. This is like a, a nightmare that's unbelievable. Well, I have to agree with you. I have to agree with you. If Jonathan is in fear of his life, whether we think he was or he wasn't at the time, if he's in fear of his life and a judge has granted a protective order in your favor, that goes to corroborate his fear. It's not just him. Other people are concerned as well. I I just don't want to see them throw away their lives. And in the end... Me me too. I just want the whole thing to... I want them safe. No, they need to stop being on the run today. This whole thing needs to end today. Penny, would you be willing, with a lawyer present for you, to speak to police? Um, The only thing is, is out of everything I've told the police, I just need a 100% guarantee that I'm not going back to my god-awful home. Because Barry Golden joining me, Senior Inspector, U.S. Marshal Service, at now at Golden Consulting. Barry, a U.S. Marshal, they're going to find Penny and Jonathan. It's a matter of time. And I don't want them to pull a full-on Romeo and Juliet where they both end up dead. They're going to be found. So can you explain to Penny and Jonathan... It may be today. I'm not revealing anything I don't I know. We don't know anything. We don't know where they are. But one day, it could be today, next week, next month, they are going to find them. And the only thing they can do right now is to cooperate. Because once they get found and carted off to two different facilities, 
it's going to be out of their control. At least maybe now with the help of a lawyer, it can be sorted out. Do you agree with that, Barry Golden? Yes, I do, Nancy. And, you know, and, and Penny's assistance in defense, she could also use the guardian at litem in Oregon to help fight her case, to speak for her there. Um, but, yes, the longer this plays out, you don't want the police and law enforcement in Oregon to be frustrated and pushed to the point where they issue a warrant for Jonathan because then if they're stopped again like they were in Nevada last Friday, the police aren't just going to let Jonathan go. They may take him into custody, and that's what we don't want. We don't want them to be separated. We don't want Penny to be visiting Jonathan in a jail cell or talking to him through plexiglass on the phone. We want this to be a happy ending and not a sad one. Lisa, do you hear, with me, Attorney Lisa Herrick, who's a juvenile lawyer, I know you hear Barry Golden. Lisa, what can they do? Look, this is what they want. Both parents want them home safe. Both parents want them safe. I don't know if they're ever going to be at home again. But that said, Penny does not want Jonathan prosecuted. She's not giving up until there's some assurance that's not going to happen. Now, he, here, here's the thing. It's not going to be up to Jonathan's family. It's not going to be up to Penny's family. It's going to be a prosecutor that makes that decision. What can they do? Exactly. So it is going to be a prosecutor who makes that decision. What they want to do is not give a prosecutor any reason to find them less sympathetic they're very sympathetic right now they're a young couple in love they're fearful it sounds like penny has um she's able to articulate very good reasons for why she's fearful what we, what we don't want to do is have them continue to run where now the police and the prosecutors think their their only option is to pursue criminal charges because that's the only way to get them to come back is to arrest them that's the only way to ensure that they're not going to run away again Penny, weigh in. Do you fear that you will be harmed if you go home? Yes, 100%. I'm doing everything I can to not go home. I, If I come back, I need, if I come out from running, I need 100% guarantee that I'm not going home. And if I get put back home, I will just leave again. Blaze Gomez joining me from News 12. Blaze, do you believe that there are charges already in the works against Jonathan? Well, that we don't know, unfortunately. Uh, we've not heard from authorities in Oregon. We've reached out multiple times. Uh, the only contact we've had with law enforcement is uh, the Nye County Sheriff's Office in Nevada. Um, they were the department that made contact with them over the weekend uh, when Penny escaped. Right. So as of right now, no knowledge of any pending charges. Dr. Bethany Marshall with me, psychoanalyst, joining us at drbethanymarshall.com. Bethany, quickly, what is your advice to Penny and what is your advice to Jonathan? My advice to them is to find adults in their lives who believe them, who can provide a safe place for them, who can validate what they've gone through. They've gone through a lot. They know the people who are safe versus the people who are not safe. Penny, the Oregon he, police said anybody helps them, they will be prosecuted. Penny, well, I can tell you one person they wouldn't prosecute, and that's a lawyer. Yeah. All right? That's, that's, I'm begging for somebody to step forward and help these poor kids. This is how I see it. Anybody on the panel, jump in. Both parents want them safe. They don't want them, quote, out there. That's the number one concern. My dad wants me to come home to sweep the floors for him. He does not want me safe. He wants me to come home so he can sit there and tell me how worthless I am and for me to just clean his house and cook his food. Number two, I believe Penny will not come home until she believes that Jonathan is not going to be prosecuted. And that will... That will depend entirely on her testimony. To Lisa Herrick, isn't it true if, even though she's a minor, if Penny went willingly anywhere, that's not going to be kidnapped? Uh, well, so she's, since she's underage, she doesn't have the right to run away. She's still a child. True. And 
True. She doesn't, I mean, she doesn't have the right to run away, so. I guess, let me rephrase my question, Lisa. Do you believe any jury would ever convict if Penny went willingly? Absolutely not. I can't see it. With her boyfriend. Right. Yeah, because we're both running for our lives. We're not just runaways. We're not just missing people. We're not just your casual, uh, we're running away because we love each other. I mean, if we were separated, we're separated. That's fine. But if one of us gets separated and then a week from now one of us are dead, then that's totally different type of separation. That's never going to be able to see each other again because one of us are dead. And then from us not fighting enough, running away, then we're going to be at guilt. One of us, Penny or I, am, are going to so, be at guilt. One of us will be abused or dead or killed or harmed severely. That is exactly what we don't want to happen. The only way that I can think of how to fix this now is for Penny and Jonathan to speak to a lawyer in that jurisdiction. They can give them some sort of guidance. You don't want them picked up by law enforcement and put into different juvenile correction facilities and a full-on adult facility with general population for Jonathan. You need to work this out before that happens. They have to turn themselves in or that's what's going to happen. So what you need is a lawyer to guide you to protect them I'm going to find you one. But for right now, I know that Penny and Jonathan are in touch with you, Wayne, one way or the other. You've got to help them see a lawyer. I'm going to help you find one, an Oregon lawyer. Penny, Jonathan, please consider what we have said. I know, Penny, you never want to go back home. I understand that. No one's saying you have to, but you cannot be on the run the rest of your life. To Wayne, to Penny, and to Jonathan, our prayers and our guidance are what we are offering you now. We wait as this unfolds. Goodbye. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.